yourself, tell us a bit about who you are, um, what what makes you you, and and how you've got to where you've got to today. My name is Ben. <laughs> so, chartered accountant by qualification. Professionally, I've been in the investment game for I don't know 25 odd years. I, lo- I worked a lot with pension funds, and we were designing investment products, so pre-retirement as well as post-retirement. We worked a lot with liabilities. I worked with actuaries. And I'll say the main thing that we did was design product, understand client needs. Yeah, I left uh, Mutual, left Cape Town, moved back to Joburg. And then I was MD of Stanlip, uh, as a management as well as Africa. And then did a brief stint with uh, Sundam Alternative Investments as a CEO. And all that was preparing me for what I'm doing. And two years ago now, two and a half years ago, I started uh, Alt Capital Partners. So what we are is that we are impact investors, uh, focusing on economic infrastructure, as well as social impact property is what we call it. And I drill in and man myself. I'm married and got a daughter who's about to turn 20 in November. And she's at Stellenbosch doing art and design. I'm a marathon runner. Ran my first race last year and done many marathons and ultras. And I love my motorbike, as uh, you saw. And I love travel, and I love reading, and I love music, and I love connecting with people. So that's kind of like who I am in a nutshell. <laughs> that's that's great, Ben. And yeah, a, a huge, a huge amount, not only professionally but also personally. I'm sure cram, crammed into those those 25 years, and that's a phenomenal journey just to hear about where you've been and who you've interacted with. And I think that's one of the things that we're hoping to bring out with this version and this series inside CNN Co Talks is really structuring it around collaboration. Uh, because I think during this time when we are physically distant from one another, we've got so much to learn from the people are around us. So the first question talks about what excites you about Africa? What excites me about it uh, are just the demographics of the continent. So Africa, still has a good growing population which is always a good investment tailwind uh, the population is young which is good and uh, and i guess from an infrastructure perspective it is very green so it offers huge opportunities for, for renewable energy for roads for transport uh, for property itself the markets uh, in terms of listed markets are also pretty much uh, nascent so Clearly, huge opportunity then for private equity, which will hopefully exit into the listed sector. It's a huge private credit market. So I'll say it's an investment haven in many ways. What is what is one of the most valuable lessons someone taught you at a young age? And I don't know whether you've uh, taken a look at my email signature. At the bottom it says, live your truth. So. Uh, so there's a fascinating story there. So many, many years back, I don't know how old I was. I could have been seven, eight. So the lesson was from my dad. <clears throat> my dad is uh, quite a smart guy who is uh, not very well educated. As in, he's got JC, which is equivalent of standard eight uh, in today's terms, but clearly a man of huge intellect and lots of wisdom. But I guess uh, what he was trying to teach me is that uh, nothing is absolute in life because life is all about perspective. So he was forcing me in a very clever way, I thought, to saying just man up, own up, do your work and inform your own assumptions and beliefs that guide how you uh, look at the world. Can you describe the best investment you have made so far in your life's journey? This could be skills, time, money, experience or travel. So I guess outside of investing in myself, I would say probably my family is the best investment that I've made. I say it, I guess, it's guided by my values, as in family is pretty much uh, up there in terms of what gives me meaning to get up each day and what motivates me to do the best that I can every day is for their well-being. On to number four, we live in a world full of distractions. How do you focus and what are some of the core ingredients that allow you to focus? Habits, space, music, or anything else? First and foremost, I guess I am driven by my mission statement in life, 
which is to co-create a world of joy and fulfillment uh, by caring. And what creates balance, uh, it's I guess what we all taught when we are, right? Healthy body, uh, enjoy the open air. I'm a lover of nature, so my middle name when I hang means he of nature. So if you get me in the bush, uh, I promise you I unwind and de-stress in no time. In terms of my spirits, as I said, uh, I mean, I practice all these things like meditation and intention. So I'm very deliberate in terms of what I do. So yeah, so it's a combination of reading, running, just uh, as I said, to your health, your mind and your spirit. What, what are inter- alternative investments and what does the landscape look like in South Africa? This is the first investment question, so that you don't think I'm a spiritual guru. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's talk investments, which is really, I guess, my passion. I mean, I, I, I had lots of time to think about alternative investments. So the universe for me is actually quite big. So the universe would be hedge funds and clearly they come in all sorts, right? And uh, direct property, private equity, infrastructure, private credits, I mean, all those are alternative uh, investments. And in terms of the landscape, or because now I guess I'm talking about passion, South Africa is not normal in relation to the makeup of our economy in many ways. So if you listen to a lot of the discourse that's currently in the market at the moment, is that yes, we do need uh, some form of reform to take place, otherwise many things are not sustainable. But yes, the world is probably the most imbalanced it's ever been right now, and COVID is showing it up. But when you come to South Africa, South Africa is the most unequal society in the world. Right, so if you look at our Gini coefficient, we run up there 65 as pretty much the worst in the world. So if you then dimension that differently to say the top 3,500 uh, people in South Africa combined, their wealth is more than the bottom 32 million people of our population. And just bear in mind that our population is only about 60 uh, million people. It means the fiscus relies on 3,000 500 people largely to support uh, the budget that uh, we all listen to attentively. And it also then means that uh, the bottom 32 million, if you look at those demographics and you say that most of it is largely uh, black, then you've got a racial issue as well. So all these things talk to a systematic imbalance, I guess, that uh, creates for a not so sustainable future if not addressed. So I guess at one level I occupy myself with that and the consequence of that is basically saying that for us to start addressing some of the ills of the past, in my view, as South Africans, we, we've got an equity culture or let me call it a listed culture. So out of our savings and investments, which is about 6 trillion czar, 97% of that is listed, right? It's on the JSC and it's on the bond market. And, uh, and only 3% is in the real economy. So it's in private equity, the infrastructure investments that you've seen. So if you, say, if you take 6 trillion and only 3% of it, then you can see the imbalance that I'm talking about. So what needs to be corrected in my view then is money is invested in the real economy. So the 3% um, moving up to whatever, 15% is what Regulation 28 says. We can move it to, and as we speak, there's clearly advocacy to even increase that uh, further. So where we sit at the moment, I say we are beginning stage of what I see as a huge growth and investment opportunity over the next 10 to 20 years. I think then private markets is a way of correcting that imbalance, and it's a way of catalyzing growth and economic development. And I think for South Africa, it will be a way of closing down the Gini coefficient as well. There certainly is a lot of opportunity. On, on to the next one, it's what is the most useful item that you've purchased during the recent lockdown due to the global pandemic? Uh, I thought long and hard about that because most of the stuff we've been purchasing, uh, what, what I termed essential items. So I was trying to think beyond essential items and then I found it. So the one thing that I did purchase is my Garmin watch. So unfortunately, I had my Garmin stolen 
one of my trips to Cape Town, just pre-lockdown actually, my last trip. And I had to borrow a, a watch from friends to do, because then I had Oceans Ultra and Comrades before they all got cancelled that I needed to train for. And actually, I needed to do my qualifying marathon, I think it was beginning of March. So anyway, so those people clearly have been missing their watches, so I'm giving them back. And I just utilize take a lot because e-commerce is a future to purchase my Garmin, which actually arrives, I think, tomorrow. So, <laughs> so I'm excited about that. Learning from failure is difficult and far easier said than done. Do you have any tips on how to turn your failures into success and learn from the challenges? Yeah, I mean, clearly, I've gone through many failures in life. But I guess the question that you're really asking is, uh, what are my coping mechanisms to, I suppose, uh, deal, deal with that? So, Josh, I'll say my coping mechanism is a process. I realize, and because I'm an introvert, which I said earlier, I process a lot more by myself. So, uh, because failure means a lot of noise at the time, right? You're disappointed, there's hurt, there's anger, there's all these feelings. So normally I just disappear. I just uh, have to go to my corner and I use the time in my corner to just process my system to fully understand the emotions that I'm going through. So, and it is a house of all those emotions. So if it's anger, I need to express it, I need to articulate it. And then not only that, but try to understand for myself, why am I angry, right? comes with a whole lot of processing. So from denial to anger to all those things is the first thing that I need to do. And normally that process normally results in depression of some sort because uh, I get to live too much in my head. And then I also then concurrently uh, have to find a way of articulating my feelings and my thoughts by sharing them with someone else. Uh, most of the time it will be my wife, uh, those people that are in my close circle and I find then by taking it from my thoughts, articulate it, uh, it also helps with the healing. And every time you explain it, you actually heal in the process. And then because I love reading, <clears throat> you learn a lot from other people that have gone through similar experiences. I'm part of YPO, which is a Young Presidents Organization. So I've got a monthly book club, as I call it. So you build a lot of trust and confidence and there's clearly safety in that circle, which is now another opportunity to, I guess, what, make yourself vulnerable and then have all these uh, other guys that clearly care for you, but are very dispassionate to your issues, give you their perspectives. But all said and done, yeah, I mean, failure is failure. It's, uh, yeah, so I live my truth. So what that means for me is, yeah, there's success and there's failure. Failure is just a learning opportunity for me. And the more I learn, the better individual I become. Yeah, life certainly is full of lessons. And, and Ben, you mentioned reading in your, in your explanation, and it's a nice segue into the next question. What is the book or books that, have, that you have gifted to, the mo to people most frequently over the last 12 months? Um, one that comes to mind is The Four Agreements. So The Four Agreements, it's a very old book, uh, which basically talks about agreements that one makes with themselves. And The Four Agreements are not, uh, it's not rocket science stuff, it's just basically how you live your own truth. So it's something like, do your best, uh, so in everything that you do, so long as you can put your hands in your heart and say, I'm seriously, Given this my best effort, so the outcome then it won't stress you out. And things like uh, don't hold on to assumptions for too long because assumptions are just assumptions. Anyway, it's four kind of like agreements, and these are agreements that define your own personal integrity that you hold yourself accountable for. And I keep on coming back to self because I suppose what fundamentally I believe that uh, we've only got. Uh, one chance at this gift called life, and we have to live it with intention. And you need to take ownership and accountability for it as well. You can't blame anyone. Thank you. I've, I've definitely added that to my, my growing reading list. So it's, it, will, it will hopefully be read this year. 
on to the next one what what advice do you have for varsity students and and young graduates who are about to navigate the world over the next 12 months i'll say to my wife i've got about five mentorships uh, that i'm advising these 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 guys on and all kind of like in different aspects of their life i give them always three questions for them to ponder on uh, which for me if you get the answers to the th- three truthfully then you'll be set as i said for the easy stuff which is going to be considered the hard stuff so the first question is as i said life you know one chance at it so live it with intent live it with purpose so the first question or guidance that i try to get them to think about is what is their mission in life and what is their purpose in life so i encourage them then to uh, live with intent and be purposeful in relation to uh, are they clear what problems is it that they're trying to solve and what are they trying to get out and then the second question is uh, know your superpower uh, we all have unique gifts that we've been bestowed with so what is your superpower so what are your strengths or what is it that you bring to the gifts to the party of life or to your corporate or to your business i mean what is your superpower because unless you're very clear what your superpower is, then how the hell do you know what is it that you are leveraging? And then the last question is normally, what is the dark side? Because we all have dark sides, or every superpower has also got the, the blind side or the dark side. So know your dark side. And clearly, I guess we've got the blessings of family and friends that always give you feedback in terms of things that you do that uh, are not saving you. So process it and be clear what your dark side is because your dark side obviously the blockages the things that get into a way of your greatness so to me it's just know yourself which comes back to that core thing i suppose uh, in essence very powerful so we started the, the conversation and the dialogue talking about africa um, and obviously the world is in a rather unique situation currently so to, to end off ben uh, the last question is where is the world going and what do you think we need to change as we rebuild? Okay, I've read a lot around COVID and I suppose uh, it is an opportunity to reset, right? It's kind of like highlighting all the ills to the world. So what are the ills? So I guess one is maybe the system called capitalism is not as pure or as effective as we were all, uh, we thought it would be, right? And maybe a lot of that is what's been shown up in the US in relation to their uh, income disparities uh, or the number of people in that economy that are still uh, reliant on food relief, which you wouldn't expect for a developed uh, country. You would have kind of like expected in developing. Uh, it's clearly shining the geopolitical issues between the West and the East. It's uh, clearly shining a light on the climate-related issues uh, in terms of how, I guess, we've consumed without being sensitive or giving back to uh, Mother uh, Mother World. It's probably also putting, getting us to think differently around globalization, right, in terms of supply chains. I think there will definitely be economic reform, and I think I've spent time in terms of how I see it in South Africa. So in South Africa, I guess I see infrastructure coming back to the fore in terms of catalyzing economic growth and development. I see a lot of our uh, savings and investments being invested into the real economy as opposed to uh, the synthetic markets of the JSC or or bond market. I'm not saying the others are going to disappear because you need both. I'm just saying that there's going to be better asset allocation uh, decisions or, or thought process compared to the 97% listed, 3% uh, unlisted. And, um, and I think our economies will, in South Africa, will definitely diversify better. I think small and medium-sized businesses will be given quite a fair chance of actually making a, a good go of it. My global concern is clearly debt because now we are sitting I guess with sovereign debt at levels that we never thought possible. So I think we're going to be going through uh, the next 10 years where global debt is going to be quite high. 
So as a result, then it means that there's a political uh, motive to keep interest rates low and to keep inflation low. So I think from a as a location in terms of where is your money going to give you back is going to be quite interesting. Yeah, so it's forcing us to think around how we manage money and how the economy is structurally uh, made up. Uh, clearly, COVID, there's going to be pain. I don't know whether that pain is for 12 months or 18 months. Awesome. And yeah, to conclude, Ben, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to seeing where you take Alt Capital Partners and the change that you continue to drive into the world. Um, I think you've shown us and my research and preparing for this conversation, you've certainly achieved an enormous amount over the last 25 years, both professionally and personally. I look forward to getting out for a run um, in, the, in the near future, hopefully. Um, and, and yeah, thank you so much again for your time and for the wisdom and lessons that you've shared with us today, because I really do think that through collaboration, we can help to make the world a better place. I agree. Very well said. Thanks very much, Josh. It was a pleasure to Thanks, you. Ben.